this event, I think most importantly, it's to understand that we are, this event is co-hosted uh, by the Goldfarb Center for Public Affairs, uh, Colby's Goldfarb Center for Public Affairs, and the Mid-Main Global Forum have put this event on for three consecutive years, and we look forward to a long relationship. So um, we have members uh, here from Colby, uh, and we'll introduce them in a minute, but uh, I just want you to know that we could not do this without without the help of Colby, without the help of Goldfarb, and without the help of our community, our supporters. So I thank you for coming. I'm pleased to, let me first say, um, the Mitchell Lecture Series, which is uh, hosted by the Goldfarb Center. Um, Senator George uh, Mitchell Lecture, Distinguished International uh, Lecture, uh, will be on September 12th, Tuesday, September 12th. All are invited. Uh, it is at the Parker Reed Room here on Mayflower Hill, uh, in, in, this, in this room, actually. Uh, and Ambassador Gelbhard, who is here somewhere, will be, our, will be our speaker, and he will speak on the international war against democracy. Uh, so. I would, like to, I would like to recognize a couple of folks. First off, we're very happy to have Dr. Margaret McFadden, provost uh, for Colby College, and the dean of faculty. So. We are also very fortunate to have uh, Professor Stacy Ann Robinson. She is the associate uh, professor of environmental studies uh, she will play a part in this program later on. Um, but she really, I do, I do want to make a couple of comments about, about Professor Robinson. Um, she has been called a superstar, has been called a superwoman by her students. Um, she's made a tremendous impact already at Colby with her students in a relatively short time. In the three years since she's been at Colby, she has published over 20 articles on international environmental policy, focusing on climate change and its impact on small developing island nations. She led an effort to gain Colby College observer status at the United Nations Framework on Climate Change, and she helped guide Colby's delegation to the COP27 conference in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, last year. So we're very happy to have her here. <laughs> Professor Robinson will uh, moderate the question and answer after, after our speaker tonight. So that'll be, that'll be exciting. Before we get into the program, though, uh, let me say a few words about the Linda Cotter Speaker Series. Some of you may know some of it. Some of you may know nothing about it. This is an event named in honor of the founder of the Mid-Main Global Forum, Linda Cotter, the wife of the previous Colby College president, Bill Cotter. Um, many of you know, uh, sadly, Bill Cotter passed away this, this year. So, um, Bill and Linda had an enduring desire to bring Colby College and the Central Maine community closer together. I think many of you have seen the fruits of their labors. As a result of this effort was the formation of the Mid-Maine Global Forum, a foreign affairs council made up of Colby and Central Maine community members interested in better understanding an increasingly complex world. The Global Forum has been conducting programs and events since 1996 offering lunch and lectures during the academic year, taking at least one of our programs to a local high school each year to help open up the world to younger minds, and hosting a grander annual event, as we have here. This is Global Forum's 27th year, and we, the community, and Colby College are beneficiaries of the foresight and efforts of Linda Cotter.
So I'd like to recognize a few people I, 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 because it's important, I think. As you can all imagine, these events do not take place on their own. There's a lot of work behind the scenes, and we're all thankful to those who helped. First, I'd like to recognize Erica Buswell, the Associate Director of the Goldfarb Center, our co-host. She has been amazing in her willingness and energy to help in seeing that this event happens. So thank you, Erica. I would also ask for the Board of Directors for the Mid-Main Global Forum to stand, if they would, please. I think all of us are extremely thankful for all they do to help make the Global Forum a success. So thank you very much. Finally, I'd like to single out one person for the years, the decades of service he has given the forum and Central Maine community. Jerry Tipper, a founding member of the Mid-Maine Global Forum, has given so much to furthering the mission of educating, enlightening, and engaging the people of Central Maine in global issues. His advice and work on where the forum should go year in and year out have, in all honesty, kept us afloat and moving forward. Jerry is a dynamo. I'm sure most of you who know him would concur that this thoughtful and compassionate attention to detail, uh, attention to what he's involved in, has impacted this community in ways that will last for a very long time. Jerry and his wife, Betsy, are moving south, not too far south. They're moving to Falmouth. Actually, they've already moved. Um, Jerry, would you please come forward, if I would? So this is uh, from us. Oh my goodness! This is this is like a a glass or, or a glass or crystal ball. But this this is a globe with a little stand that says Jerry Tipper, Mid Maine Global Forum. Sincere gratitude for your uh, time and dedication. So thank you, Jerry. Thank you. And thank you. I'll, I'll be very. Don't, don't get up. <laughs> so, about 27 years ago, I got a call from Linda, uh, basically telling me about her idea to start a global forum, and she asked if I would be willing to be in her initial board and work with her. And then I succeeded her as chair for many, many years. I can just tell you, if she were here tonight, she would be absolutely thrilled at the turnout and the quality of the program. After 27 years, it's just so exciting that the group is sustaining and growing. And I'm just so happy to have been part of it. But anyway, thank you. I'm delighted to have this. Now, now, uh, now down to our speaker. I'd like to now introduce the 2023 Linda Cotter Speaker Series speaker, Abram Lustgarten. Abram is, at his core, an investigative journalist who focuses on the environment. His work on climate change, the economy, and human migration are excellent, and I encourage you to look them up if you have not done so already. Abram is a graduate of Cornell and Columbia Universities. This isn't his first trip to Maine, and we hope to see him again in central Maine. He is an internationally known writer and reporter for ProPublica, uh, the New York Times Magazine, the Atlantic Magazine, and PBS Frontline. His work has appeared in Scientific America, Wired, Salon, Esquire, and the Washington Post, among other publications. We are very honored to have him as our speaker tonight. Please welcome Abram Lusgarten. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good 
got to get my notes back to the top. All right. Thank you, everyone. It's really wonderful to be here. Um, it's an honor to be invited. And uh, thank you to the Mid-Main Mid Global Forum and to the Goldfarb Center for its interest in this issue. Um, really pleased to be able to talk about it. Um, migration is something I believe is so important to the future balance and stability of the world. Uh, I've come to care a lot about it through through my work and my reporting. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think the future of human migration is one of the most consequ consequential aspects of uh, the issue of climate change. Um, so to get there and to get into our conversation tonight, I want to start with the past, very far back in the past, um, because I think it gives a little perspective about the things that you're about to hear um, and puts the change that we're living through uh, in, in that historical context. So moving, it turns out, is the ultimate form of climate adaptation. Somewhere between 60,000 and 80,000 years ago, told you, far back, um, the earliest Homo sapiens fled Africa because of drought, and they chased the bounty of a green belt uh, of vegetation northward. And they made it as far as the Middle East, mixing for a few thousand years with the Neanderthals before extreme climate shifts drove those Neanderthals to extinction. As the Ice Age lowered sea levels, the surviving humans then walked across exposed land bridges south across what are now the islands of Indonesia, perhaps sailing short distances to New Guinea before walking onward to Australia. Only later, with the retreat of those glaciers exposing verdant northern latitudes, could people settle on the European continent and beyond. And such has been the role of the environment in shaping where people live on the planet for all of the ages since. Sorry. 3,000 years ago, the Indus Valley emptied out because of drought. Some anthropologists believe that 1,100 years ago, Mayan civilization crumbled because of water shortages. 900 years ago, Chinese herders moved 1,000 miles northward into the Russian tundra, seeking new pastures as the northern plains of Asia thawed. Ever since, humans have been driven across continents by ambition, by persecution, by aggression, curiosity, and evangelism, but looming larger than perhaps anything else <clears throat> were the changes in their climate. So about four years ago, I set out on a project to understand how the changing climate today will again lead the population of the planet to reorganize and to migrate, and to understand the far-reaching implications for stability and for society. This was a project that would eventually wind up as a three-part series in the New York Times Magazine, and, uh, and is now the subject of a book that I've written that comes out early next year. And I travel through Central America, through Mexico, and the American South, reporting in rural regions and tagging along with the United Nations and with their World Food Program. We hired researchers who had first built migration models for the World Bank to build new models for us, forecasting rates of human migration in response to climate change. We tried to build on the academic research body and sharpen a more precise picture of what was to come. Future migration is different than what's happened in the past because the world is different. The transformation of the planet's environment today is unlike anything in history. So this is a picture that represents the average global land temperature by year starting in the early 1800s into the present, with red showing the degree of anomaly from that historical average. The changes are more extreme, and they're unfolding more quickly. And at the same time, the number of people affected, the number of people on the planet, is vastly larger than any other previous point in the world's change. Consider, for example, that when the Mayans were thought to have succumbed to drought around AD 900, the planet's total population was just 226 million people. By the time scientists began warning in earnest of climate change, the mid-1970s, the world's population had swelled to 4 billion. Since then, the number of people has doubled again, nearly 8 billion, or I think we just surpassed 8 billion, now inhabit the Earth. By 2070, the world's population could be somewhere between 9 and 12 billion people, depending on the policies that are put in place at this point. All the while, even with the change already baked in, the Earth will continue to warm. My central question was this. Could better understanding climate-driven migration's role in conflict and in current events help us plan better for the future? And at the heart of my interest was a conviction that as the planet slowly cooks, People will do what they have always done for thousands of years in response to changes in their environment. They will move. 
The first big question then is how many people? And to answer that, we have to consider how many people will be most negatively affected by climate change. It turns out that there is an optimal climate zone for human life, a climate niche. For the past 6,000 years, humans have gravitated towards a narrow range of temperature and precipitation that supported agriculture and later supported economic growth. But now that niche is shifting towards the poles. According to researchers who published this research in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences in, in uh, 2020, uh, the change that we're seeing now is happening faster than at any point in, uh, in the history that they've examined. Climate change is remapping, literally, where humans can exist on the planet. Historically, only a small sliver of the Earth's surface, just about 1%, was so hot that researchers described it as uninhabitable. But today, that sliver is fast expanding across some of the most crowded places on the planet, including the entire equatorial belt of the African continent, from the border of Morocco to the coast of Kenya, as well as all of South Asia and the near entirety of Brazil. By 2070, some 19% of, of, the, of the planet will be too hot. This change is well underway. Already more than 600 million people have been stranded outside of the crucial environmental niche that best supports human life. Should the world continue on its present warming pathway where we make political gestures at reducing emissions but don't meaningfully reduce uh, global carbon levels, we will miss the Paris target by a long shot. The planet will likely warm not by 1.5 degrees but by approximately 2.7 degrees Celsius on average. And that pathway could lead to 2 billion people falling outside of the climate niche within just the next eight years. That's a moderate estimate. 3.7 billion people would fall out of the niche by 2090. So consider a worst case projection. With 3.6 degrees of warming and a pessimistic climate scenario that includes ongoing fossil fuel use or little political response to emissions, the shift in climate niche would pose what the authors of that paper called, quote unquote, an existential risk. It would directly affect half the projected total population or as many as six and a half billion people on Earth. Either way, the total number of people left outside of the climate niche will have grown between a third and a half of humanity by later this century. Climate change will pummel the poorer parts of the world disproportionately, effectively sentencing the people who live in developing nations and small island states to extreme temperatures, to failing crops, to conflict, to water and food scarcity, and rising mortality. According to the researchers' projections, India will have by far the greatest population outside of the climate niche. At current rates of warming, the researchers estimate that more than 600 million Indians will be affected. That's six times more than if the Paris targets were achieved. In Nigeria, more than 300 million citizens will be exposed, seven times more than if emissions were steeply cut. Indonesia could see 100 million people fall out of secure and, predict and predictable environment, and the Philippines and Pakistan, 80 million people each, and so on. Whole swaths of land in Brazil, in Australia, in India especially, would become less habitable. Many smaller countries might be nearly erased entirely, with all or nearly all of their land becoming unlivable. Burkina Faso, Mali, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, Niger, among them. The U.S. faces far more modest impacts, but impacts nonetheless. The South and the Southwest will fall towards the hottest end of the climate niche, leading to higher mortality and driving internal migration here northward. This is what the shift looks like in the US. We took data from the climate niche research from the paper that I, that I described and mapped it over North America for the purposes of my research. And you can see that that optimum zone moves from about the lower Southeast and Appalachia right up to the Canadian border and the Great Lakes. Not everyone, of course, whose environment shifts, even outside of this niche, will migrate, but they all will face a choice. They can remain and endure that change in circumstance, or they can move. Most people, just from a purely mathematical standpoint, won't go anywhere, uh, or they'll shift in small distances. But the sheer number of people affected suggests that even if a small fraction do, the change will be transformative. And this is how we get to what I think is coming next, which is the great human migration. 
In many parts of the world, this migration is already well underway. Climate pressures are already leading to upheaval characterized by insecurity and food shortages and political and armed conflict. In North Central Africa, caravans of famished refugees have evacuated from the drought racked shores of Lake Chad. In Bangladesh, flooding coastal deltas have sent a crush of people first to the slums in Dhaka and then toward the Indian border. And in the United States, a quiet exodus away from the front lines of Western wildfires and the Gulf Coast hurricanes has hollowed out small towns. <laughs> Perhaps no example is more telling than what happened in Syria. In Eastern Syria, farmers faced a historic drought. Their animals died erasing their livelihoods. And so many migrated to Syria's cities. They became impoverished in those cities, and eventually they joined the uprising against the government. And the rest, civil, civil war, is a familiar history. Now, what happened in Syria was by no means a climate-exclusive event. Climate was just, and the environmental change was just one of many influences there. But the result, nonetheless, was millions of refugees fleeing in rubber rafts on the shores, to the shores of Turkey and to Greece, and ultimately on to Europe. You're going to hear about other situations later in this conversation about uh, a familiar pattern. We start to recognize the same progression from displacement to economic strife or conflict uh, to migration. The climate shocks don't have to be localized all the time either. A bad wheat crop in Russia in 2011 interrupted the export of grain to North Africa, causing food shortages that combined with high unemployment stoked the Arab Spring uprisings in Egypt and in Tunisia in Yemen and Libya. Together with the war in Serbia, these up, in Syria, uh, these, up, these upheavals drove large waves of migrants to Europe in 2015, ultimately instigating or at least influencing the UK's exit from the European Union and causing plenty of political turmoil from Germany to Greece and Italy too. This just gives a sense of the scale and the reach of that refugee diaspora when an event like that occurs. Can we be sure that all of these situations are linked to climate change? Probably not. There's a large margin for error. But a 2017 study published in the journal Science examined the asylum applications of migrants to Europe from 103 countries, and they found a very distinct and clear correlation. As home climates worsened in the countries sending immigrants to Europe, those countries sent ever larger numbers of refugees. Now, as, destabling, as destabilizing as these waves of migration arguably have been, though, they were also relatively small. Combined, these conflicts brought just about 2 million people to the European continent between 2015 and 2017. And as you'll see with some of the numbers to come, we can expect that this is just the beginning, the subtle first signs of an apocal slow motion exodus out of inhospitable places. So, where will we see that upheaval first? The World Bank and academic researchers at places including Columbia University have begun to identify a number of hotspots around the world where they expect significant climate migration to emanate from in the future. One of those places where circumstances might be the most urgent is North Africa's Sahel. The band of nine countries sandwiched between the Sahara and the humid savanna is probably the most at risk of any region on the planet. More than 150 million people live there, and nearly half of them depend on subsistence farming to survive. Yet that land is quickly turning to desert. Its trees are cut down for fuel, and its soil is eroding from overuse and poor management. The drought here is among the worst in Africa, and already more than 100,000 people have died over the last several decades as access to water has decreased. At the same time, the population in the Sahel is growing faster than almost anywhere else on the planet, stretching those scarce resources even further. Each woman in the Sahel, on average, gives birth to about five children. Across Northern Africa, the World Bank estimates that there could be 350 additional people by 2050, 350 million, excuse me. The known water supplies will fall far short for tens of millions of these people. The World Bank's chief climate economist laid this bare for me in very frank terms. It really stretches the imagination to see how this can work, he told me. The bank's researchers expect migration to follow the same progression for how people have moved in the most vulnerable parts of the world in the past. 
First, migration begins in rural areas, which are often the poorest. They're dependent on fertile soil and abundant water, and these pastoral lands will begin to empty out. Most people, though, hope to remain as close to, po close to home as possible, and even when they decide they must move. So first, perhaps, they'll jump to some mid-sized town in search of work and remaining close to family. Then, perhaps, they'll move to a capital city in what academics call a stepwise fashion. Only after that will they begin to move across borders and across continents. But that rural outmigration will drive a rapid urbanization that could quickly make cities dangerously overcrowded. The World Bank, for example, is sounding an alarm around the mind-bogglingly huge influx of people into East African cities like Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, where climate stress here is declining crop as, and declining crop yields are driving people from the countryside into the city. The population here has doubled since 2000, and it's on track to double again by 2035. The bank predicts that as the climate worsens, some 57 million more North Africans will migrate within their own countries, searching for livable conditions. It's a pattern that will be replicated on other continents, too. But then what? Right now, a little more than half the planet's population lives in urban areas. But by the middle of the century, the World Bank estimates that 67% of people will live in cities. Urbanization is a global phenomenon regardless of wealth, but it's the world's poorest people, the same people continent by continent whose ability to feed themselves is most affected by the climate crisis, who are the ones rushing out of rural areas fastest. In Africa, rural to urban migration, according to the World Economic Forum, is happening almost 11 times faster than it is in Europe. People move to cities because they can seem like a refuge. They have community, they have facilities, they have infrastructure, but they can just as easily become traps. Demand for water and electricity surges, and food, which increasingly needs to be imported, becomes more expensive. The costs drive the poor into slums, which suffer worst from the lack of clean water and sanitation, and they're dangerously built, and they're especially pr prone to flooding and other disasters. So the quality of life begins to spiral downward. As unemployment and poverty rise, so does human trafficking and domestic abuse. And as sanitation deteriorates, disease increases. Oops. This graphic shows the outpouring of rural regions into cities in Central America and Mexico. And it's based on some of the modeling projections and the data that I used in my reporting. So what happens next following this urbanization is what nations around the world seek to avoid most. Criminal groups become a substitute for government. Slums become hotbeds of extremism and chaos, ultimately fomenting conflict that can spill outward and destabilize whole regions. The recruiting and fundraising of Al-Qaeda, for example, has been linked to hardships in agriculture and animal grazing. By 2030, the World Bank estimates that four out of every 10 urban residents, or more than 2 billion people globally, will live in slums. And the International Committee of the Red Cross estimates that almost all of that growth, 96% of it, is expected in the world's most fragile cities, the ones that already face heightened risk of conflict. So here's how researchers from Columbia University and the United Nations put it to me. Societies affected by climate change may find themselves locked in a downward spiral of ecological degradation, towards the bottom of which social safety nets collapse while tensions and violence rise. As for Africa, it obviously sits adjacent to all of Europe, and the experts I spoke with fear the continent's climate-related losses will feed what one called a constant outpouring of people. It may be a very similar story in South Asia, though, which is also home to roughly 2 billion people. Oops. There we go. Himalayan glaciers are disappearing, and meltwater from the Himalayas, the water tower of Asia, supports the lives of nearly one in four people on the planet. The greatest rivers, the Indus, the Brahmaputra, the Ganges, the Yangtze, the Mekong, the Irrawaddy, the Salween, the Yellow River, they all run from these high glaciated peaks down to some of the world's largest cities. Just south of the mountains, a band of irrigation-dependent agriculture stretches for hundreds of miles into the lowlands of India and Bangladesh, of Myanmar and Vietnam, and Thailand, making it possible to grow the food that feeds the continent. <clears throat> At the same time, 
temperatures there are skyrocketing, and the intensity and frequency of cyclones and flooding are increasing. So as the economies of the region have become increasingly unstable, some 8.5 million people have already fled that region. Tens of millions more have begun shifting about internally, moving from rural areas into the biggest cities, into Delhi, into Dhaka, and Lahore, and Karachi. The World Bank estimates that even under a relatively optimistic climate scenario in which global carbon emissions are brought, emissions are brought under some control, 17 million South Asians will be displaced within their countries due to increasing environmental stress. Under a bad case climate scenario, it projects 36 million people might leave their homes. The bank didn't even count the effects of rising seas in its models, though. Climate scientists have recently said they underestimated the number of people about to be displaced by rising tides globally by a factor of three. They now estimate, and this is in the latest uh, UN report, that between 150 and 630 million people globally will be forced from their homes as sea levels rise over the next three decades. This will inundate places like southern Iraq, places like eastern China, and the entire southern tier of the United States, or much of the southern tier of the United States. On the Mekong Delta, the livelihoods of about 20 million Laotians, Cambodians, Thais, and Vietnamese are in jeopardy as sea level rise threatens more than half of the land that they rely on for agriculture. That farming is essential, not just to the people living there, but to their broader national populations. In Vietnam, for instance, the farming of, Mekong Del of the Mekong Delta it accounts for 24% of the country's GDP. It's the source of 90% of the country's rice exports, 70% of its fruit crop, 60% of its exported fish harvest. Now, coastal flooding will be an issue around the world, including in the US. But I want to bring you back for just a second to Africa, because here too, we find one more devastating example, and that's in the agriculture-rich, low-lying Nile River Delta. The delta includes the cities of Alexandria and Cairo, which is just at the bottom of, of the dark triangle that you see there at the, at the uh, mouth of the Nile. More than 40 million people live and farm here, and they produce a significant portion of, of Egypt's food supply. And already, crop yields are falling fast with rising temperatures. But by later this century, one third of the land there could be submerged, displacing about 10 million Egyptians. The third hotspot though smaller by population, is Central America and Mexico. Those places will not escape the drama of warming either, and this is where I focused the bulk of my own research. So I arrived in El Salvador to conduct my own reporting in May of 2019. And over the next several months and several trips, I traveled north into Guatemala, into the border, across the border into Mexico, and traced the typical migration routes all the way up through Mexico to the U.S. border in the city of El Paso, Texas. In textbooks and reports, researchers described a clear mechanism for how large numbers of people move. They have computer models that simulate it mathematically in detail, but it becomes a very cold and analytical process. What I wanted to understand was how people make that decision to move and who exactly should be counted as a climate migrant. So about a week into my first trip into the region, I headed to the heart of Guatemala uh, to a state called Alta Verapaz. Alta Verapaz is an extremely vulnerable place. The region is a large, remote blade of land that reaches from the high mountains in Guatemala in the center of the country all the way down to near the Gulf of Mexico. And it's one of Guatemala's poorest and most populous places with 1.2 million people. The people here are mostly indigenous Mayan, and 90% of them live in moderate to extreme poverty. They farm as their main source of income and subsistence, and hunger is increasingly common as conditions become more difficult. 80% of the population here cannot always access sufficient food, and almost one out of two children show signs of stunted growth. In 2018, a starvation alert group affiliated with US aid ranked Alta Vera Paz alongside Somalia as one of the most urgent famine risk places on the planet. The United Nations warns that temperatures here are rising faster than average and water resources are diminishing quicker. The swings between extremes and the intensity of storms are growing more pronounced than elsewhere in the world. And for much of the five years before my arrival, the dry corridor mountains, those are the high hills of Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador and Nicaragua, 
which lie in the rain shadow of western coastal ranges that capture the moisture that comes off the Pacific, they had seen virtually no summer precipitation at all. The future projections for these places are worse. Maize production in this part of Guatemala is forecast to decrease 14% just by 2050. Rice yields by 2070 could drop by nearly a third. And this is because areas of Guatemala that are now considered semi-arid, including Altavera Paz, will soon be more akin to desert. Rainfall in arid parts of the country is expected to decrease by 60%, and groundwater recharge will drop by more than 83%. I arrived there in a village called Panzos. It's a loose grouping of wooden huts and primitive one-room houses with dirt floors, bright lights shining between the boards. Children sat around with visibly bloated bellies. Jerry cans of drinking water and gasoline were scattered around doorways where chickens and pigs walked freely in and out. We stopped our truck by a cluster of better constructed homes. And these were the ones built from wooden boards nailed to a frame. And we were looking for two men that we knew through the World Food Program, had led a local farming cooperative here. Ava Hernandez, which is who this is, greeted us in front of her house in an open space of beaten earth and compacted soil. Her family lived in a single room, enclosed by rough-hewn lumber boards capped by a rusted pa pallet of tin nailed to the roof. That tin trapped that burning heat and turned that room into an oven. Sharp stones and small boulders protruded from the floor, and against her wall, besides a full-size mattress, full mattress, a wooden basin held an oily car battery, jury-rigged to charge her cell phone. Besides that were a couple dozen cobs of dried corn, maize that the family crushed, mixed with water, and used to make tortillas, which was, at that time, their only source of food. Eva, and later her husband Jorge, told me a story of hope. It was also a story of, fail of their failed effort to grow food of one failed effort to grow food after another. Jorge was the third generation in his family to work this land. His father was a Mayan farmer, had fought bloody battles to reclaim access to his ancestral fields from rich colonial landholders. They'd finally been allowed to lease it back on a rent-to-own basis, and Jorge was making good progress towards that purchase. He planted maize and beans on a flat sec section of silty soil that lay about a mile from the fast-moving currents of the Cajabon River, which flows down into the Gulf of Mexico. His crops were almost entirely for food, and he sold what was left over, for money to buy sugar, for bus fare, to send his kids to the government school. Though his fields were right there by the river, he had no irrigation to pipe and pump and distribute that water, and so they, they relied entirely on the rain. But in 2014, the spring rains failed to arrive. Meteorologists blamed it on the El Nino cycle, when the trade winds over the Pacific switch directions and pull moisture away from the American coasts. El Nino used to happen once or twice in a decade here, but it happened again in 2016 and again in 2017. In 2018, it finally did rain, but the timing was off. In the spring, Jorge's seeds were first scorched in arid heat and then they were drowned by the dousing downpours that followed. That fall, Jorge gambled his last seeds, trying to plant a second crop. And finally, that crop grew fruitfully. Then an unexpected flood came. Huge storms in the high mountains sent a flash flood roaring down the valley. Jorge and his seven-year-old son waded chest deep into water, searching in vain for a few juvenile cobs of corn that they could still pluck and eat. What had first seemed like bad luck was fast becoming a matter of life or death. His children, malnourished, had not grown taller or gained weight in more than a year. His options were limited. He'd already put a lien on his land for more seeds. The big corporate farms around him weren't hiring because of the drought. Men like him were getting robbed and killed when they took dangerous jobs in Guatemala City. The farm co-op that he was a member of pleaded with the Guatemalan agriculture officials for emergency aid they just needed a few thousand dollars to install that irrigation, but they were ignored. And so he pawned his last few assets, the motorbike, his father's animals among them, and he paid a guide or a coyote to help him travel to the United States. One night, just two weeks before I arrived, he gathered around the hut that I sat in with his entire extended family. They shed tears, traded hugs. The Mayan people are not accustomed to migrating for work the way so many other parts of people in so many other parts of Guatemala or Mexico are. 
And Jorge packed his and his son's belongings in a small plastic grocery bag. And just before midnight, they left. So I want to just dwell here for one moment and underscore how excruciating and heartbreaking a decision this was for, Har for Jorge and for his family to make. I had expected, in going to this part of the world, to find something much more pragmatic. I expected a neat list of pros and cons, about an opportunistic decision, about prospective opportunities, and the people who thought they might find it in America. Instead, it was, by all accounts, a last resort. It was an attempt at mere survival. I heard similar stories up and down Central America. Fathers torn from their children, leaving land that they'd been attached to their entire lives, marriages slipping apart over late night phone calls on disposable cell phones, while migrants face terrifying unknowns in big American cities like Houston or Los Angeles. Their migration was not pragmatic. It was an act of desperation. They had done everything in their power to stay. And by the time Jorge and his son left, or all of the others, there was no choice. Now, for others, the thing that ultimately forces them to leave might be several steps removed from the dying crops and the paralyzing heat. And yet, they are collateral damage from climate change just the same. And it raises questions about what defines a climate migrant. In San Salvador, I met a woman named Elvira de Jesus Cortiz. Elvira was 22 when I met her, and she was working a job in the city cooking pupusas at a street-side food stand. She made about $7 a day, and her money went to pay rent and to buy baby formula. She ate at work because the food was free. And when she met me, the first thing she told me was that she wants to leave El Salvador, and she plans to get a housekeeping job in somewhere in Texas. But that would mean, and this was the hardest part of, of what she had to tell me, that she'd need to find someone immediately, maybe temporarily, to take care of her daughter. When American officials describe the reasons the Central American migrants are coming to the U.S. border, they point to gang violence and conflict as leading drivers that force people to move. And that's what U.S. immigration statistics or European immigration statistics say. All around the world, conflict, war, violence, they remain the largest factors affecting human migration. The Syrian example is textbook of that. But also, just like in Syria, the story is not always so simple. Edelvira's husband was murdered by gangs in, the small town, in a small town in the mountains of El Salvador, near the Guatemalan border. That's what forced her to move to San Salvador with her infant. And now street gangs force her to pay protection with her meager wages. And they routinely rob her apartment. So yes, Edelvira is a victim of violence. And maybe she'll be driven out by that violence. But before she was a victim of violence, she was also a victim of environmental change. She moved away from the village that she grew up in after a climate-driven fungus wiped out the coffee crop and half of El Salvador's income from coffee with it. She says that she'd go back to that village today instead of leaving her daughter and emigrating to the U.S., except for the ongoing drought. And her family remains in that village, where they walk 30 or 35 minutes just to get fresh water, and where they are among the 44% of Salvadorans that the United Nations says has long lacked a steady and reliable source of food. So if Edelvira leaves El Salvador, will she be a refugee fleeing violence or a climate migrant? Increasingly, the, dis the difference is blurring. So there we have it, excruciating last ditch decisions and huge unfathomable numbers, so large they may be difficult to comprehend. One half of humanity? The next question is what can we do about it? Large-scale shifts in global populations will force difficult choices on the parts of government. They'll exacerbate social and political stress points, invariably threatening conflict. By the time I got to Mexico in my reporting, I saw this friction building in real time. Thousands of Central Americans were pouring across the southern Mexican border in the months that I was there. At the same time, U.S. policy from the north was pressuring Mexico to stop immigration. At first, Mexico was sympathetic to these migrants. They greeted them with open arms, and Mexican President Andreas Manuel López Obrador expressed unconditional support. We will take you all, he promised. But as those months wore on, the Mexican public lost patience, and they lost their empathy. The Mexican authorities began to crack down harshly, rounding up migrants at gunpoint. A few thousand were welcome. A few hundred thousand? 
Mexico was besieged, and it quickly led to rising nationalism and right-wing violence. And that's what's happened the world over and what is likely to continue. Syrian refugees come to Turkey, which attempts to pawn them off on Europe and on Greece. Hungary has fenced off its, its border from Serbia, part of nearly 1,000 kilometers of border walls surrounding EU states. India is completing a wall along the 2,500-mile-long border of Bangladesh, building walls, keeping people out. Even in the US, this is what we're doing. This is the US-Mexico border at the top and Lithuania-Belarus on the right. The choice whether to build walls or proverbially, proverbi proverbially wells through aid is one of the fundamental choices we'll face going forward. As part of my research through ProPublica and the New York Times and with some support from the Pulitzer Center, we ran our own models examining climate migration in Central America. We worked with the same demographers who worked with the World Bank and sparing you all the intricacies of, of that process, the model suggests that the U.S. border could well see 30 million additional migrants over the next several decades. But more important than the numbers, the models looked at how policy changes immigration or how policy changes migration. The models broke down the analysis following several socioeconomic scenarios that the UN now uses to understand the intersection between policy choices and climate emissions. And those scenarios lay out starkly different outcomes. A future in which emissions are slowed and geopolitics remain open, in which trade is robust and controlled immigration is welcomed, leads to more migrants coming to the US, but lower populations overall, globally, and less poverty and suffering, including in Guatemala. It suggests that greater global economic and geopolitical stability can be achieved. A more hostile future, according to the models, in which nations retreat behind walls, pursue more nationalistic policies, and are slower to reduce their emissions, that leads to faster population growth globally. It leads to deeper poverty, poverty and increased famine. And ultimately, it suggests that vastly larger numbers of migrants will push against the US border. Before we wrap up, I want to switch gears here for a moment, because it's worth noting that many countries in the North both stand to benefit in some ways as the climate warms, and because they're almost all facing demographic decline, will need a lot more people, perhaps immigrants, to seize on that opportunity. As a part of this reporting, the third part of, of my magazine project, I, took, I looked at this dynamic in Russia, which is one example of a potential strategic winner. There's two things about Russia. It has land and it needs people. And with warming, more of its frozen land is becoming more habitable and more useful. An influential Stanford University study estimated that Russia could see more than 400% growth in its per capita GDP as the climate warms. Russia is already capitalizing on the opportunity. Growing grain, it is, depending on, it is, depending on the year, already the largest exporter of wheat globally. And with warming, it's implemented a number of domestic strategies, including using immigrants from the rest of Asia to make all of its land productive. In the Russian Far East, where this change is happening fastest, the region has another dynamic. It sits north of the second most populous country in the world, China. Chinese migrants are already spreading northward as thawing permafrost opens new farmland in eastern Russia, and the Chinese see new opportunities for growth there. The two countries have many strategic alliances, but they're all intertwined. Arms deals, for example, are in part conditioned on the Far East remaining open to these Chinese immigrants. And the two countries share an interest in, a in opening shipping lanes from northern China through the Arctic. So it's not inconceivable to imagine a future where China's huge population begins to spread northward onto a thawing tundra. Elsewhere and around the world, the North will also do well. Canada could see its per capita GDP grow by 230%, according to the study, due to climate change. But it, too, needs people. The private sector in Canada is pushing what it calls the Century Initiative, and it's a plan to grow the population of Canada from 32 million people to 100 million people by later this century. So as a result, logically, Canada is welcoming many more migrants, and that's a recognition that human capital drives economic prosperity. So. Everything we're talking about today suggests that climate-driven migration could easily eclipse even the largest estimates as enormous segments of the Earth's population seek safe havens. The same data that suggests that one-third of humanity could soon be excluded from the climate niche 
also makes a moral case for immediate and aggressive policies to slow down the rate of warming and to lower the number of people globally destined for greater suffering. What we do next makes a difference in terms of cutting emissions and in terms of policy. The world has already warmed by about 1.2 degrees Celsius on average, and that has pushed 9% of the Earth's population out of the climate niche. At 1.3 degrees, the research suggests the pace will pick up, and for every tenth of a degree of additional warming from here on out, 140 million more people will be pushed outside of that niche. The Paris Agreement has set a goal of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, but that now seems all but unrealistic. Scientists estimate that the pace of political change has us on target for 2 to 2.7 degrees of warming, and that might be optimistic. The science, on the other hand, is clear. Every ton of carbon dioxide cut directly translates to less heat. Slowing global emissions would dramatically reduce the number of people displaced or grappling with conditions outside of the climate niche. These were the key findings of the same researchers who identified that climate niche, and they published them in a follow-up study, a monumental study in Nature, just a few months ago. If warming were limited to 1.5 degrees Celsius, the Paris target range of warming, half as many people would be left outside of the optimal zone. Recall for a minute, if global emissions were held back in Nigeria, the number of people displaced from the climate niche would drop from 300 million to approximately 40 million people. The global population suffering from extreme heat would be reduced fivefold, from 22% to just 5% of the people on the planet. The moral case makes clear who should bear responsibility for that effort. Throughout the world, the climate niche researchers estimate the average person who's going to be exposed to unprecedented heat comes from a place that emitted less than half the per capita emissions as of those in wealthy countries, and one-fifth that of Americans. American per capita emissions are more than twice those of Europeans, who still live a prosperous and modern, modern existence, so there would appear to be ample room for comfortable change short of substantial sacrifice. Each American today emits nearly enough emissions over their lifetime to push one Indian or one Nigerian of the future outside of their climate niche, the study found. And this makes clear exactly how much harm Americans' individual actions can cause. And this is the thought I want to leave you with today. What we do next matters. Regardless of policy differences on how to get there, we should now clear see clearly the stakes. If this summer's taught us anything, it is that. The steps to addressing them are well understood. They are doable. They rely on technology that already exists. We just need to take those steps, one and then the next, and keep going. Reducing consumption, for example, doesn't have to mean lowering our standard of living. It might just mean lessening waste or getting rid of inefficiencies. And achieving that would not only slow down the rate of warming, but it would reduce the number of people elsewhere who will suffer the consequences tomorrow. So with that, I'll finish up and look forward to your questions. And thank you so much for your attention this evening. And I'm also going to shamelessly plug my book, which if you have the patience to copy down the URL, you can find the, you know, the pre-purchase stuff. Can I have one more round of applause for our And already there are hands up. I didn't even have a moment to sit down to say thank you very much to our speaker. So I imagine that you're all bubbling uh, with questions. And I've been asked to indicate that there are microphones uh, roaming around. So if you could ask your question directly into the microphone, because we are recording. So this is our moment to say something big, something powerful, something influential that could potentially change the world, right? <laughs> and it's my favorite part of the night, so bring it on. <laughs> All right, if I may, I'd like to ask the first question, and I've just been thinking about this very much. I want to know what brought you to this line of work. So if you could take us back a little bit, 
before you started here, how did you get here? To journalism or to climate change? To climate migration. Um, I have an incredibly privileged existence at ProPublica, which if you're not familiar, it's a, it's a nonprofit uh, devoted to investigative reporting that's willing to put an enormous amount of funding behind very in-depth projects. And so what that means for me is that I have the luxury of um, going very deeply into a subject and not publishing a story for a very long time that would probably get me fired at any other news outlet in the world, uh, which lets me dive deep. And um, so that's that's one factor. Um, and then and the other, you know, it was a brainstorming session. I mean, the, the um, coming up with the idea was a collaboration between my editors at ProPublica, my editors at The Times. Um, you know, thinking about what we could do that would, you know, what are the what are the few largest issues around climate change? And you could say that that's biodiversity. You could say it's a number of other things, um, but one of them certainly is this notion that it was going to change where people live on the planet, um, and it really hadn't been uh, touched in a meaningful meaningful way by, um, you know, the media that I look that I look to for examples, and so it was an opening, uh, and I was incredibly curious about it, and that was the beginning, and everything after that was just this long period of um, earning a you know symbolic PhD in the subject. Those PhDs, right? All right, so let's have the first question. We have someone with a microphone. Abram, I thought that at one point, when you were speaking specifically of the United States, that some of the southern states would be within the niche and that some people would remain. And I don't understand if there's no food, no crops, no water, how, how could they? How would they be able to remain? In the southern United States? Yeah. yeah. I don't think we'll get to that point in the southern United States, except maybe in the southwest, Arizona, New Mexico, um, southern California. Uh, it's really a different, the, the impact is a different order of magnitude. What Guatemalans will see or the, or the African Sahel compared to what the United States will see. Um, the impact will be great enough to disrupt everything that's familiar to us about what the United States is and where people live, but it won't be so disastrous that people cannot, I don't think anyway, it won't be so disastrous that people cannot live on that land or that um, you know, they're, they're literally expelled from it. Um, you know, so what I take from that data is uh, you know, the difficulty of living in those southernmost regions is going to increase sharply. And it's going to increase more dramatically in certain places like the Southwest. Um, but those places won't be entirely unlivable. In fact, I think that um, you know, a lot of people will continue to live there. Um, unfortunately, what the models say is that the people who remain will be, uh, you know, will be poorer than average um, and, and uh, older than average. Um, so you know, mobility corresponds directly to means. And if you have a young family and a professional life and professional opportunity in the places that you go, you're more likely to move. And for Americans in particular, that'll probably be a driving force that um, brings people out of the South and towards the Northeast on balance. Okay, great first question. I think one of the takeaways from what I heard at least is just the variability across the planet, just so much variation, not only in the climate impacts, but also in the migration patterns. So definitely something to keep in mind. All right, second question. Yeah, yes. I, I'd wonder if you'd just speak uh, briefly to the general issue of resistance to change, uh, particularly uh, as it pertains to understanding the, the extent to which uh, global climate change is a significant problem for us all. Um, I think somewhere in there is a political question. Uh, well, not just in the United States, but globally. Are there patterns that you see emerging? You know, I think if we're talking about, you know, acceptance or embracing of, of the reality of climate change, I think it boils down to three things, or maybe I'm forgetting something, but we'll see. Um, in no particular order, there's entrenched interests, which is, a, you know, a big factor. So there are, you know, there's a global economy that's based on the way things work now um, that sees itself threatened by the proposition of changing the priorities of that economy or the driving industries of that economy um, or even the rates of consumption of that economy. So quite literally, as you've read in exposés about Exxon and, you know, and others, um, there are 
forces working against that adoption of you know of the reality of climate change. So that's that's one. Um, a second, maybe I just have two here, but I think you know I think psychologically it's just hard to fathom the enormity of the change, and um, you know it's scary to think about. It takes time to think about. You know, so you know, relative to the wealth of, of a lot of other parts of the world, we have that luxury to think about it here in the United States, but other places or poorer people in the United States, especially, you know, are, um, are just trying to make ends meet. So that's, that's a factor. And then the more you do think about climate change, the more overwhelming it can be. Um, this was not an uplifting conversation. Uh, it's not a pleasant thing to spend, you know, all of your waking hours thinking about. Um, and I think that that you know that contributes to a propensity to just kind of go along with the status quo, and um, the change is so f slow that it's almost imperceptible in any given moment, uh, and you can just ignore it quite easily for a long time. Quick follow-up: scale of say one to ten, how optimistic are you about our being able to handle this in the next oh, generation or two? On a with ten being, oh yeah, it's a slam dunk, no problem. Um, you know, I think it comes down to your definition of handle this. Uh, so the change is upon us. Um, the scientific consensus is super clear that the change will be extraordinary. Um, I really think that there is enormous opportunity to still mitigate how severe that change is, uh, especially in the northern parts of the world. And so I wish nothing was changing. Um, I'm saddened by the reality of it all, but I find some hope uh, in the progress that's yet to be made. And I, I feel like I've learned that that, as I said, that the progress is, uh, the need to make it is so urgent that um, try to spend a little less time, uh, you know, being depressed about it and more time just doing the next thing that needs to be done. All right, thank you. Well, one word that I heard there that stood out to me was resistance. And one of the things that I've learned from my line of work is that resistance isn't always a bad thing. So have you seen any evidence of resistance that could be interpreted as a positive thing? Or has there been any resistance to move that we need to consider as we think about these issues? That's a tough question. Well, we can think about it and take the third person. <laughs> I mean, I no. I mean, I'll try to answer. I can't, I can't really think of an example of uh, if you mean resistance to like the reality of climate change. Um, you know, um, most of what I see around the world is, uh, you know, is a negative resistance to either a change in thinking or a literal change, you know, in economies and habits um, that uh, that people just don't want to make. And then those intertwine a lot with a lot of other socioeconomic issues where there's other forms of resistance around, you know, racial justice and economic justice, um, tax policy, um, relationships between governments. Um, I don't see a lot of positive resistance in those examples either. I'm sorry to say. No problem. Can I add one of my own? Yeah. Well, what I've seen a lot in small islands is that people just don't want to leave their homes because there is this genuine connection and deep connection to the land. So oftentimes when I present, I hear, why don't people just move? And my response is, it's always just a little bit more complicated than that. So we have to think about the nuance in these conversations. So something you can take with you. Yeah. All right, third person, thank you. Hi, uh, I have lots of questions, but the, the one that I think is, concerns me the most is that you talked about individual actions versus policy decisions and uh, you know individual actions like uh, becoming a vegetarian or uh, getting a car that doesn't use as much or travel as much uh, for many people you don't see that really translating in any way but policy makes a huge difference and you're your statistics and your work with the World Bank is interesting, I think, in terms of the fact that it's my understanding that the World Bank is also one of the primary keepers of uh, developing nations poor. 
And is there any cross discussion <laughs> at the bank about, you know, the amounts of influence they could have versus trying to put this on individuals who, you know, we've, in Maine, I think that people are pretty good at learning to conserve and you don't even hear anything about conservation anymore. But um, it, it really is such a bigger issue than me becoming a vegetarian. And I think for any kind of real hope, it would be those institutions that have the ability to do that, but at the same time are keeping developing nations poor and enriching uh, the rest of it. Yeah. Uh, there's like five pieces of that I'd love to take apart. Um, but first of all, you're right. Uh, you know, and a, a whole project that um, that I worked on over the last two years after the migration work was um, about small island states, was about Barbados, uh, was about the role of uh, the IMF and the World Bank in, um, in holding these countries in these regions down. Um, and you're right, there is incredible, as the massive uh, multilateral institutions that they are, there is incredible potential and unbelievable depths of money available there to make a real difference if they would only apply that. And, um, and you know, the converse, there's a lot of policies that both of those institutions uh, pursue for economically balancing distressed nations' debt, for example, which was the focus of, of my reporting, um, that are sort of a new modern form of colonialism and have the opposite effect that really um, you know, keep a lot of those countries um, on the same treadmill that they've been on for, for decades. Um, so that really needs to change. I think you're seeing that the bank has a new director that's more oriented towards climate concerns. Um, it's made a lot of pledges that it hasn't fulfilled. Uh, the IMF is probably a little ahead of the bank in terms of its transition. Um, it's got a lot of high-level staff who are very cognizant of these challenges now um, that are trying to um, implement them. You're seeing slowly, um, you know, the Bridgetown Initiative was uh, presented at the last COP meeting, and that's based off of the work of uh, leadership in Barbados and Bridgetown Barbados, and it's um, it's it's basically a platform that suggests that the IMF and the World Bank can use their reserve funds uh, and should use their reserve funds to create you know a um, free debt and funding for deserving nations um, and a, and a new definition of uh, you know of debt balancing. Um, so that's underway, and I think there's some cause for optimism there. Um, the second side of the question, I was talking with. Uh, one of you last night uh, about this question, and, and I was just saying that, you know, mostly climate change is a government scale problem. Um, you know, we cannot solve it as individuals. Um, it will require, you know, the mobilization of enormous policy mechanisms and efforts. Um, but the, I don't think that the inverse is true. I think that what individual people do still makes a difference, and I'm not sure that those big uh, policy changes can happen successfully without individual effort. And that's kind of like a newer um, perspective for me personally. Uh, but, you know, we need in America, we as consumers have incredible leverage, um, you know, to determine what change happens and how that change is politically supported. So whether that's like not using plastic water bottles or uh, putting heat pumps in our house or moving, you know, to electrify our infrastructure electrify our vehicles. Um, those are choices that make a big difference. Um, but two funny facts, because you mentioned them specifically. Uh, I think that, um, I'm not a vegetarian, just so you know. Uh, but not eating meat is one of the biggest things that people can do uh, to help the environment at this point. Um, done a whole lot of work on the Colorado River, for example, and there's this crazy statistic that we calculated when I was doing that research. Um, which basically said that Amer if American, the, the water consumption of cattle for beef is so enormous in the United States, and it's through the feed that's produced, the alfalfa that's grown with that water to provide feed for the cattle, which we then consume. Um, the water consumption related to eating beef is so great that if Americans were to skip eating one meat meal per week, just like meatless Mondays, it would save the equivalent of water of the entire flow of the Colorado River immediately. So you look at like the debate over water scarcity in the Western United States, that's one potential way to solve it. Um, and the other uh, fun fact is that um, 
uh, feed farm cattle flatulence happens to be like one of the very largest sources of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States and in a lot of Central and South America as well. I, I would just mention that we have plastic water bottles here and there were plastic cups. And honestly, in, it, it just seems to me that the college is very good about trying to think how it can create buildings and uh, less resource intense uses. And I don't know what can be done with the uh, organization that provides the food and all of this, but it seems to me that the college should influence them to like take that small. Right, well, I can emphasize that the college has been doing a great job um, in terms of moving us towards environmental sustainability. This might have been just an oversight on this particular um, occasion, <laughs> but... <laughs> well, vegetarian. Very much so. And I can also say that we also have a big research grant um, in my department as well, looking into uh, cow emissions and, you know, cow excrement. So you are about to see some very big discoveries out of the college, and we're going to take care of all of this. Right? <laughs> right, Margaret? Right. Yes. <laughs> so thank you for that observation. All right, let's hear from a fourth person all the way to the back. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Um, this may be a little simplistic, but uh, with climate change and, and uh, changing environment, we talk about a lot of stop doing things. But history suggests that humans don't do that very well, that uh, new technologies tend to be with that work tend to be uh, more effective uh, at getting done. Um, yeah, could you talk a little bit about sim uh, simple things? The oceans are rising and we're running out of water and desalination, um, which doesn't seem to be caught on around the world very much. Is it a difficult technology? And some significant changes in the way farmers farm um, uh, would be a, is another area that people have been looking at. Yeah. Um, so first off, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't place a lot of faith in the argument that we can afford to wait for a technological solution to climate change that replaces all of the other actions that we know we need to make. I hope that technolo technological improvements will also contribute to chipping away at the, at the reductions that need to happen. Um, I think there's lots of places where that'll happen. Um, but I think it would be a mistake to wait for that silver bullet, which um, hasn't shown any signs of, of emerging on the scale that it would need to. Um, and so desalinization is an interesting um, question. It, it's, a, it's a fantastic technology. It's not difficult. Uh, it is very energy intensive, uh, and it's also a question of, of scale. Um, so it should and it is being deployed widely, um, and hopefully that'll increase. Um, hopefully renewable energy can be used to power that, um, but it can require a whole lot of natural gas or a whole lot of oil, for example, to, to you know, desalinate seawater on the southern coast of California, for example, um, uh, or in Israel, which uses natural gas to do it, is another great example. Um, and then it's just a matter of scale. I think that, uh, you know, I don't know the numbers, but um, the amount of water that's needed and consumed around the world is just um, of a, of a complete, many orders of magnitude more than what you know industrial facilities can process and produce. Um, I don't. I just don't think that when you count aquifers uh, and the water that's drawn from them, that we could ever use man-made facilities to keep up. Thank you very much for that extraordinary overview and um, description throughout history, but also con in today's world, what we're facing. Um, I've worked for over 50 years on international development, and a lot of what you describe, I've um, <clears throat> tried to help, and and here we are. It, it still, we're, the numbers that you were relating were just... I won't say depressing because we don't want to be depressing about this because we need to do something. So in, in the context of thinking more, thinking positively about what can we do 
I wonder if you've talked to ProPublica and uh, the editors that, that helped you do this project to try to find examples of uh, from the local to the national or even regional, but pri primarily local and national, of uh, tackling these problems in, in their context. Because I find that in my own work, finding examples that work uh, are, are very encouraging. And then people can adapt them to their own circumstances. So I just wanted to, I guess it's more of a, comp a comment than a question. No, but it is a question. Would you consider doing that? <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, I appreciate the question and the sentiment behind it. Uh, and there's some room for some of that, um, which we have done and, and will continue to do. But unfortunately, we're not really in the, the good news business. Um, <laughs> Which is just by nature of, it, it's already a stretch, the, um, the work that I do there compared to the work that, um, that others do there. We're really a hardcore investigative news organization that's aimed at um, uh, you know, holding people accountable for clearly defined crimes and climate change by comparison is this sort of enigmatic um, issue uh, that's difficult to wrap our minds around. Um, so yeah, there's a room and there's a need for that. Um, there's also positive things that are happening uh, and that can be done you know, that don't fit into the, you know, didn't fit in at least the way I chose to, you know, uh, structure the conversation tonight. But I'm thinking about like foreign aid, for example. Um, you know, in part of my time in El Salvador, um, you know, I spent time with the World Food Program that was with very little money. I think something like fifty thousand dollars had, uh, you know, gone to a village an hour outside of San Salvador that I spent time in and. Um, and built greenhouses for the people there. And uh, I spent a couple days with a guy who had migrated, uh, emigrated to the United States three times, similar to the story of Jorge, but he had gone, he'd spent a couple of years, he saved some money, he came back, he tried, made another go of it, he left again. Um, he didn't want to leave again. He had what he needed with these simple greenhouses. He had food, he had sold enough of that food to buy cows, so he had milk. I mean, it was just like a very simple system. Uh, you know. And I think that's an example of, um, how significant uh, just a little bit of financial support can be in slowing the numbers that we talked about tonight. Um, you know, I keep wondering, like, well, what if the government of Guatemala or someone else had just stepped up and bought that irrigation system that Jorge needed in Guatemala, right? Like, problem solved, maybe. Um, that can't cost more than a couple thousand dollars. Uh, you know, some PVC piping that would stretch a mile. And he's got it. So simple inner, you know, um, interferences in these trends can make a big difference. I've read, I've written a little bit about both of those examples, but um, yeah, I hear that maybe there's a desire for more good news. I'll try. Great, thank you. Oh, so many questions. Uh, you choose. Thank you. So I have two reflections and a question. The first reflection here is what we've experienced together tonight. And, and I think there was just an emotional feeling in the room. I just kept hearing breaths going in and oh no, and what? And part of that came from your kind of reporting, the stories you were telling. They weren't just numbers, but they were people who came into our community here. And I think going to Tom's question about resistance, one of the things that we can really do as a community is to, to tell those stories, to try to support journalists like yourselves, because this work is, that you're doing is really, really hard and detailed, and I'm sure you have layers of stories um, that go to your heart. So thank you for touching our hearts, and I hope we can, we can extend them going out. Um, so that was reflection number one. Reflection number two is we had at Colby a, a while back a talk, Jerry's going to remember this, by Bill Mumar. Jerry, do you remember Bill Mumar? He came and he talked about the ways, right? The ways in which Maine was becoming like southern New Jersey. <laughs> it's here, folks. It is here. That's that change. Really, really important. And so then my question goes, I think the missing actor on all of this is corporate life, right, and corporations. And we've seen a lot of positives coming out of 
ESGE, corporate social responsibility, something that I'm very interested in, but also a lot of pushback at the same time. So I'm wondering how you might connect those pieces and ways in which we can empower through you know, consumer buying or, or other different ways to mobilize the resources, the technology, a momentum for change. On the first part, thank you. I really, really appreciate that sentiment. And you know, all that I can hope for anybody who does this work is to like, you know, supersede delivery of information into something that actually has it, you know, has an impact or changes how you feel, because I think that's what makes issues, you know, resonate and stick with you. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, on the second challenge, uh, and the book has data on Maine, for example, um, uh, and it is getting closer to New Jersey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, not not culturally, not at all culturally. Um, in terms of your average nighttime lows, it is getting closer to New Jersey. Uh, um, I, I don't have an easy solution. I, you know, I mean, this this like begins to cross into just sort of you know personal opinions, not reported. Uh, you know, anything reported, uh, and it becomes really controversial. Um, you know, but my personal feeling often these days is that we have uh, a, ver a form of, of kind of extreme capitalism that just seems a little bit um, incompatible with the changes that need to be made. And I don't know how you get from point A to point B. Um, I imagine that it comes, you know, either from changing the incentives for corporations so that they're um, differently motivated to make money, but not as much money, or to spread the money that they make over a broader area, or to contribute some of the money that they make to some of the, you know, to addressing some of the impacts that they have, or even addressing some of the impacts that they don't cause, but other people are causing, um, because we're an economy-driven society. So that's one. And then, you know, the other thing I think comes back to taxes. Um, and if you want to let, you know, the private sector keep kind of running at the pace that it's running and, and um, seeking the profits that, that it seeks, then, uh, then we just need to fund the coffers of the institutions that exist that are able to, or in theory, able to, you know, make their own investments and, um, and fix some of this stuff. Um, that it kind of has to be has to be one or the other, uh, and neither is perfect. And uh, you know, government spending of tax dollars is far from perfect. Um, but there's nothing that I look at in the climate sphere, domestically or internationally, that I don't um, finish my thought with. It's going to cost an unbelievable amount of money. Um, it's just going to cost money. So wherever you can get it, um, start getting it. So if I may just tack a question onto that. Is there anything we can do as citizens to combat greenwashing? Uh, you know, it gets to some bigger issues, but be, you know, stay well informed. Be well informed from the right places. Um, be skeptical of, you know, of the, you know, the slant of the information that you're getting. Please don't get it from social media. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I think just awareness. I mean, there's always been there's always been marketing, sophisticated, you know, manipulation of people's opinions or or reclassification of what something is to make it look like something it's not. Um, this is no different. It's just um, it always comes back to the motives. You know, as an investigative reporter who spent a lot of time before climate change looking at the oil industry, for example, like you can. Tell me all you want that BP now stands for Beyond Petroleum, which I wrote a book about. Um, <laughs> you know, but just a healthy sense of skepticism and some knowledge of you know of how they earn their living, uh, you know, should make you question that. I think you just apply that more broadly. All right, thank you. We had a burning question over here, so if we can just get the mic. Yes, seems burning. I can feel it. <laughs> She had her hand up before the watching hands, and you had your hand up before anybody else so far. <laughs> a, a few answers back, and uh, one of your comments just now, you were talking about um, petroleum, uh, natural gas, and um, 
oil, the fossil fuels. Um, you did not mention um, wind power or solar power, which perhaps might be a good thing because it's from my understanding that thorium is cheaper, more efficient, and a better energy source than anything we currently have. It's also my understanding that there are members of Congress who know about this, but apparently, and this I'm not so sure about, the uh, fossil fuel industry is so powerful that thorium has been pushed to the sidelines as an alternative energy use. Would you mind commenting on that? Um, well, I feel really silly, but I don't know what thorium is. <laughs> Give me your name and number and I'll, I'll tell you about it. <laughs> well, maybe you could comment I mean, on whether there are other sources um, of energy that we might not be yeah, for sure. Is that, to. Uh, yeah, so if we could just have a broader comment on that, I think it might be helpful. Yeah, all right. Well, I will say, um, you know, again, my personal opinion is that, um, like, nuclear energy is powerful and essential, and we should be using it, a lot of it, and more of it, um, uh, with all of its downsides. Um, it's the only other technology that produces carbon-free energy at the scale that we need, um, full stop. I mean, I don't know what else there is to say about it. It has, it has lots of problems, but everything has lots of problems. Um, you know, so do those, you know, solar panels and, and turbines. Um, so we need more nuclear energy. Uh, I would also, I, I just think that the, you know, the arguments against transitioning away from fossil fuels are, you know, pretty specious at this point, like the market growth in wind power and the market growth in solar power, um, you know, is, is fast and large, um, you know, and uh, those industries are taking on a life of their own and they don't enjoy the kind of subsidies that the fossil fuel industries had, um, or they didn't until, you know, until recently, now they're getting them. Uh, you know, so I have great confidence in the growth of those industries, and they're dependent on minerals. I think we'll find them. Um, we've literally barely scratched the surface. Um, and, you know, I don't hear, there's some interesting other new technology. I think they're really like fringe and, and niche. Um, you know, there's that study that came out a couple months ago about uh, the ability to, to um, pull generative energy out of, out of the air. Uh, from MIT researchers. That's kind of interesting. I mean, um, we could eventually have boundless and unlimited energy without doing anything. Um, but maybe I'm just not expert enough in, in, the other, uh, in the other alternatives that are being developed out there. All right, thank you. I will not try to intervene with who is next. Can you tell me? I'd like to thank you for coming and talking and giving us really important information. My concern is the data that's collected, the statistics that are delivered, very, very important in terms of that. But it seems to me that there's an audience that's missing in terms of voice. There's an audience that's missed in terms of how these things are going to impact, and that's young people. Have you considered doing this type of presentation to a high school, a middle school? in elementary school. Because if we're going to talk about change, and we're going to talk about the kinds of things that are going to impact, and I don't mean to sadden everybody in the room, but most of us are not going to be here. I want our legacy to be one of progressive thinking ideas as we move forward. So how do we integrate the whole notion and idea of PK-12 education, which by its very nature is political? How do we begin to talk about these kinds of things in schools in an integrated way, where you have integrated curriculums, where you have project-based learning, the models that can develop? Because we've got some tremendous minds in schools that are going untapped. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, you know, so part of it, it just uh, surpasses my expertise. Um, but I've done a little of that. Uh, I would say so. So I've done some work and received a grant from the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting, and the Pulitzer Center has a program uh, that works in high schools around the country. And I've presented to a dozen or so of of their classes some similar information, similar material, you know, about migration. Um, 
uh, I teach a college level course about climate change and writing about climate change in general um, that kind of informs you know those high school visits. Um, I fully agree with you about the importance of you know of younger age uh, students. Uh, I have young children. I have not yet wrapped my own mind around how to have this conversation. They're coming home starting to ask me about it, uh, and I'm evading their questions at this point. Um, so that you know that really scares me, and that's that's uh, the next task. And then you know the middle schoolers. Um, I think there's enormous, yeah, I think that's a really important question and a really important opportunity. Just don't have a good answer for you yet. All right, I'm told we have time for two more questions. So. <laughs> this sort you. of follows up on some of the others. Given the inevitability of climate migration, are there any groups, you mentioned uh, Russia and China, but are there any other countries or international groups who are making sort of a plan or a roadmap for this incredible change rather than just reacting when it happens? Um, yes. Um, I'm going to struggle to to recall uh, a lot of good names for you right now, but there's a lot of organizations working at different levels um, to do that. Um, and if you want to follow up, I can find some of them and, and send you an email as well. Um, you know, at the top of the food chain, there's the UN as the International Organization on Migration. Um, they study this, they lobby for it with their member nations, um, and uh, they're deeply involved in trying to, you know, facilitate um, some adaptation. Um, the World Bank is as well as evidence from the amount of research they've done that, you know, that I cite. Um, I have some skepticism about their motives, but they're still doing the work and they're doing better, you know, better research than a lot of other um, outfits. And then, you know, there's, um, there's dozens of smaller, uh, organizations, um, from there, uh, the World Resources Institute, environmental organization is, in, is involved in some of these issues. And then domestically, um, there's, there's groups in a lot of the countries that we talked about tonight and including, you know, in the United States, there's, uh, you know, there's active discussions about migration and preparing for it, um, with organizations varying from like, the Urban Land Institute, which is, you know, a, a, a re, a, really a real estate organization, um, you know, to uh, a group I worked with called the um, American Society of Adaptation Professionals. Uh, so it's like a planning committee. Um, there's, uh, I, f I forget the exact name, but there's a mayor's task force uh, of cities around the country um, that are actively involved in planning for both the cities that will become smaller and the cities that will become larger, and how they can, um, you know, meet the meet those changes proactively. Uh, so th there's a, I'd say it's like a young uh, and evolving discussion about the implications of what we're talking about tonight. Right. Thank you. And our big final question. Hit the pause. Tell us who it's going to be. <laughs> All right. This jazzy young lady up front here. <laughs> Mike. Thank you. Uh, I was very impressed with the data that you talked in the beginning about population growth. And I was wondering, we always talk about climate change in isolation. And is there any cooperation or policy making or whatever with the World Health uh, Organizations? Because, I mean, what about birth control and what about uh, health education and in that whole realm that would control uh, population growth? It's a fantastic question. Uh, it's a really difficult uh, question um, without saying more about it because I can't, but it gets right at the heart of another project that I'm working on right now, which considers you know um, both population growth's impacts on the climate, but also um, what happens when you start talking about population growth, which is that it it brings out a lot of uh, a lot of bad stuff. So everything from you know eugenics to um, you know to just uh, outright racism. Um, so that's what makes it really sort of a third rail conversation, um, and that's why it has been a really sort of muted conversation. Um, you know, the United Nations, the you know the climate the big climate reports, they have chapters on population growth and control. And I think that there's, um, you know, big aid 
uh, organizations and big environmental organizations have always had a focus on, um, you know, on on uh, expanding women's education, expanding women's access to um, uh, to reproductive medicine, and you know, and protecting reproductive rights. Um, those are kind of the critical, you know, the three pillars. Uh, and there are a lot of programs. Um, that do that work all around the world. Uh, but there's not a lot of talk about those programs because it gets really sticky and it very quickly um, invites, uh, you know, a lot of kind of malevolent um, actors that just skew the whole conversation and mess it up pretty good. So, but it, it should be, um, yeah, I, I don't know how you bring it into the center of the conversation, but it's important enough to be at the center of the conversation. Yeah, it's, it's the big factor. Well, let's give a Abraham. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, our 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 fundamental mission is to expose, educate, and engage. The engagement is really important. Engage the people of Central Maine in world issues, and I think our guest today has really. Uh, helped us all better understand, maybe a little more depressing than we may have uh, wanted to hear. But the important thing is that action can make a difference. And I think Abram made that very clear. So we are incredibly thankful for him coming. We're thankful for you all coming. Um, Erica, would you like to come up? We, we have a small gift for our speaker. Eric. Yes, thanks Abram so much for coming and sharing your research and your wisdom with us. And on behalf of Colby College and the Goldfarb Center for Public Affairs, we so appreciate that you have really brought this message to us, emphasize the importance of this as a current affair, as an international affair, and couldn't have said it any better than Patrice as a former director of the Goldfarb Center. You have also touched our hearts and shared your call to action for how we as individual citizens have a responsibility to engage civically with this. So small token of our appreciation, no matter what the climate is, where you're headed, where you're headed. Thank you so much. It's really, really kind. Thank you.